Hey, what's up, everybody? This is episode 39 of the Ridge Hunter Outdoors podcast. The reason you're hearing just me right now is because we actually recorded this podcast with the whole crew, Nate and Jeff and Dad were in here, and we talked about, to start the podcast, we talked about some really uh, interesting stuff that has to do with trail cameras. Unfortunately, all that got lost due to some technical issues, go figure. So... I'm going to try to kind of recap that and then put this in and then we'll pick up where with what we had left uh, on the back half of this podcast, which was talking about times of year that we like to hunt best. Um, some things we've already talked about, but we dove a little bit deeper into it. But before I get into that, I don't want to let you guys forget about our sponsors. I know it's been a while since we've done a podcast, so apologies for that. We've been pretty busy. Gonna try to stay more consistent with it again now, like we should have been doing the whole time. But like I said, things came up. We've been busy. Uh all that good stuff. So hopefully we'll be back on a regular schedule now and we can get rolling. We should be a lot closer to episode fifty two, because I think we started this last September or last August. So we're only on thirty nine, but we're gonna get them rolling here again. And like I said, uh I wanna get into our sponsors before we start though. Grandpa Ray Outdoors is the first one. You guys know they specialize in providing the best nutrition for whitetail deer on your property, starting with the soil. They offer a full line of high-quality food plot seed and plant foods. Uh, they were started in 2015, but John, the owner up there, has actually been in the seed nutrition business since 1991. So now with over 14 different food plot blends, uh, you won't have any trouble finding what you're looking for. They've got fall and spring blends. Uh, they've got grain, switchgrass, liquid fertilizers, test kits, uh, you name it. They pretty much got it when it comes to food plotting. They aren't just about selling their products, though. If you got any questions for them uh, about what blends would be best on your property, um, you know, you can reach out to them and they'll help you figure out what would be best and how to plan it to get the best results possible for your situation. That said, John, you know, like us, he doesn't believe in the cookie cutter approach to wildlife nutrition, and they'll treat your your situation individually. So they aren't going to tell you the same thing they tell the guy down the road unless you're in the exact same situation. So. They aren't about a fancy label or package either. They're about good quality seed and taking care of their clients. We've used their blends on client properties in the past, and the results have been as good as advertised. We're using some of their stuff on our food plots now as well. We're going to do some more of that this fall, and we're going to continue to use them, and that's the biggest reason we partnered with them on the podcast. You can go check them out at GrandpaRayOutdoors.com and use their discount code RHOPODCAST to get 10% off your order. Our other sponsor that you guys know is Rack's Big Game Supplements. They are a veteran-owned company out of northeast Nebraska. Uh, th these guys are deer hunters just like us. And at the time when they developed their products, they were just not happy with what was already on the market for their supplements and uh, minerals. So they did a, a bunch of research, and over a few years, they finally came up with one of the best mixes available that's going to help improve your herd's overall health while not feeding non-target species. Uh, they've got minerals, protein blocks, pelletized feed, and meal feed all specifically designed for whitetails. You guys can use discount code RHO22 at checkout to receive 5% off your entire order at RaxMineral.com. Or you can stop by the shop and see what we got in stock. Uh, we do still have some of their stuff. Uh, the 40-pound bags, 18-pound bags of mineral, and then some protein blocks as well. And uh, even if we don't have what you're looking for, we can order it, save you a little bit on shipping, and then uh, let you know when it's in at the shop. So business side out of the way. What we talked about that got lost... Uh, which is kind of disappointing because I thought it was a pretty good conversation about the trail camera stuff that's happening out west. So the basis of the article by Dr. Dave Samuel out of the Bowhunter magazine uh, is around uh, Utah House Bill 295, which they recently passed. And he starts off uh, by saying, in our February issue, I presented problems western states are having with the use of trail cameras. At that time, I noted that Utah was considering some changes that has now happened, and here is the new law. So, House Bill 295, during the 2021 legislative session that instructed the Utah Wildlife Board to make rules governing the use of trail cameras for in hunting. The game agency surveyed 14,000 big game hunters asking for feedback on potential changes. The survey, they sh the survey showed that the majority of the hunters opposed using trail cameras that transmit images in real time. So, from July 31st to December 31st each year, 
Cameras that have internal storage memory as well as wireless cameras that transmit images to the hunter's smartphone cannot be used. Private landowners can still use cameras to monitor their property and agricultural operations, but most hunting on both private and public land is affected. And then he goes on and he talks about some other states where this stuff's happened. There's some laws in New Jersey, or I'm sorry, New Hampshire, Nevada, uh, Arizona. It's, it's all kind of been going on since about 2015 is when all this stuff started coming down. So the reason we talked about it is kind of concerning for us as this stuff continues to gain traction and you see it in more and more states. It feels like it's only a matter of time until it affects us here. So, you know, we kind of talked about what would be the effects of that and then basically why this was ever brought up in the first place and who would stand to gain from it because most stuff, especially politically, is driven by gain for somebody, uh, monetary most of the time. And just thinking about it, you know, without sitting down and really thinking about it, just thinking about it as we were having a conversation, the biggest thing we could come up with is maybe this is just a foothold that the anti-hunters have grabbed onto and it got pushed through because most people aren't really affected by this. The biggest, you know, the biggest group of people affected by these kind of legislative decisions are the hunters and the anti-hunters. Nobody else really cares. This stuff flies under the radar. And the problem with that is it seems like the anti-hunters might have an ear have the ear of some of these politicians more so than we do and on top of that hunters don't get out and vote like they should so that's a really big issue and some of this this stuff's going to continue to happen if we don't do a better job at the ballot box just showing up and then you know voting doing a little bit of research and voting for people who are going to be against these types of things uh, limiting us on what we can do for hunting because really it's about technology and hunting and there's a lot of blurry lines that could be drawn in there and where do you start and where do you stop what is considered too much technology to hunt? Uh, what's, you know, where do you draw that line? It, all the bows we shoot now are new technology. The hunting clothes we wear are new technology. It's all 21st century stuff, just like the trail cameras are. Why that's considered more of a benefit? I don't know. Like we said, maybe this is just something that, a foothold that they've grabbed onto, so this is what they're pushing to try to help. Because as everybody knows that hunts and uses trail cameras, it, it still doesn't kill the deer. We made the point the other night in the first part of this podcast, between the four of us, we probably run 13 or 14 cameras on our different places that we hunt. Nate's the only one that killed a nice mature deer last year. Um, he used a camera to help him kill it, absolutely. He knew it was there, but that's one out of four of us running between 13 and 14 cameras that it actually helped produce that deer. You still have to get out there and do it, whether you know he's there or not. Um, so it's hard to see really where they're coming from on this or why it's happening, but it is a little bit concerning. So if you guys want to, you can get the Bowhunter magazine from July. I believe it's in the July issue. And check out that article by Dr. Dave Samuel. The actual title of the article is Keeping Abreast of Technology and Disease. He actually went in to talk about some CWD stuff too, which we might cover some of that and some EHD as we roll into the summer, but the end of the summer. We've got a lot of other cool stuff we want to talk about as well. I'm going to try to get some more guests on here, but that just kind of gets you guys caught up on what we talked about in the first part of this podcast that got lost. And then all that said, I'll go ahead and roll into the second part that we actually got caught. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, an article by Kurt Wells. And it's talking about, I'm not going to really go through the article much, uh, maybe not at all, but if you guys want to read it, you can check it out in Bowhunter Magazine. It's by Kurt Wells. One of the Ask Bowhunter entries. And I'll, I'll read the first paragraph, at least part of it. It says, You're, uh, The question is, I am planning to hunt the Midwest for whitetails this fall for the first time. What dates do you recommend for my hunt? And then he goes in and kind of, break, kind of breaks down all the phases of the season from middle of September on to November and the late season. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's really the same thing as like uh, the Drury's have a show called 13, which is their 13 phases or whatever. You can Google that. I don't know if you can Google what this guy's talking about or not, but it's essentially the same thing. So you break down the season into however many phases. They do it in 13. Some people do it in less than that, more than that, whatever. Basically, there's a certain set of dates from the middle of September to early October that the deer do a certain thing, and then they change, and you hit the October lull for a little bit. And then you hit in that like first seeking phase, 
you go into the first week of November where the does are starting to come in and then you go into lockdown and then you have another period after that where they're kind of looking for the last bit of does and so on and so forth. So he breaks that down. He talks about how a lot of his luck is right around the end of the first week of November. So either or the beginning, uh, two days either side of November 5th is essentially what he says. But overall, his conclusion is that you can't really pick a certain day. Um, he says basically just pick your time for your vacation somewhere roughly end of October, early November, and put as much time in as you can that part of the year. Because there's so much other that goes into it, weather, stuff like that, how the year's been. So with that said... I wanted to get your guys' opinion, and I know we've talked about this before, but I want to get your guys' opinion on when your favorite days are, uh, Nate, when you take your vacation, and then kind of why. And like I said, you guys can go back and listen to past episodes where I think we've hit on this. I don't know if it was like the topic of the episode, but I wanted to make it one because like he said, this guy's asking, sending the question. A lot of people are planning their vacations right now. And starting to put stuff together because we've got two months till a season, month and a half. Well, two months till the middle of September when a lot of seasons start out here. So what are your guys' opinions on that? Man, hunting uh, hunting the Midwest, is a, that's a broad term, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but for hunting right here, uh, I always get excited November 5th. Uh, I mean, that's when I, from then on, i got to be out there. Mm-hmm. Um the past two years we've talked about trail cameras uh last year you know Mm -hmm. uh, early fall we talked about trail cameras the past two years i have noticed real good buck movement around october 26th uh right in there somewhere Um, and then it seems like they disappear for a couple days Uh, at least i ain't getting their pictures then they start again uh november two three four right in there um 2019 i watched a stud mature buck breed a doe twice the morning of november 5th mm-hmm. uh, i feel like that's really early last year i watched what i thought was a three or four year old breed a doe uh the afternoon of november 2nd and i just i couldn't believe it mm-hmm. uh, but I, mean, I watched it i thought that was really really early um uh, but it happened mm-hmm. um i wouldn't know what percentage what early percent that would be you know would there be 5% of does in then, you know, right. the 2nd, the 5th? I don't know. Uh, but if he's looking to hunt the rut, you know, uh, November 5th to, what, 25th? Would that be the would that be the yeah. peak, what you'd consider I'd say here? somewhere in the middle of that would probably land you at lockdown, so you'd want to avoid that if you could. Mm-hmm. So in that, are you thinking that that's your, in your opinion, the best time to harvest a big mature buck would be in that uh, window versus... September or late October, early October, late season. I'm thinking that this guy is saying, I want to go to the Midwest and I want to see the Midwest rut and just see everything bust wide open, you know, and hope that I get to kill one. Uh, Yeah. And we'll say, so just his specific question, I'm planning to hunt the Midwest for whitetails this fall for the first time. What dates mm -hmm. do you recommend? So I think you're probably on a good track there. If you're going to recommend some dates to somebody to really get the experience, Yep. Taking that into consideration for the I'd, first time. I'd tell him the first full week of November. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I always got excited. I've seen a lot of good stuff there. Um, I've killed one uh, the 5th, the 7th, the 9th, the 14th. Last year was the 21st. Mm-hmm. Um, those are just dates I can remember off the top of my head. I've killed good bucks. Yeah, decent or good bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say the first full week of November till. Uh, gun season, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, this guy's talking about, well, we'll assume he's talking about bow hunting because it's in the bow hunter magazine. Mm-hmm. So, like you mentioned, and like he mentioned in the article, you killed yours on the 21st, which was gun season. So, yeah. that's something else to take into consideration when you're planning your trip. You might have to work around it or, mm-hmm. you know, avoid that altogether, whatever state you're going to. <laughs> it, and maybe that would determine what state you're going to. Yeah, normally it's best to, to avoid it altogether. Yeah, I yes. <laughs> yes. But... So you're thinking, you know, first week of November. Mm-hmm. I would think the guy, if he's coming to the Midwest for the first time, he he wants to see it blow wide open and mm-hmm. and and see the chase and see all the action that he can. You That's know? probably the best bet. Yeah. Yeah. What about you guys? So my records from the shop, 
from process until me, uh, no pun intended, November the 10th. So the 13th through the 19th. Now, uh, at the latter part of that stage, sometimes that first gun season comes in as early as the 17th, mm -hmm. sometimes as late as the 20th. So that definitely affects the later part of your, your hunt. But if you're planning to spend seven to 10 days in the teens is where we see the most mature bucks that are killed that are definitely rutting. Every one of them's rutting by then. It's, it's not you're going to catch an early rut. You're not going to catch some of them sniffing around. Um, but but my numbers prove in the teens that week. Yeah. The only thing days. I think you would you might run into there is if you do catch it closer to that gun season and you hit lockdown, you're not going to see anything. No, if unless gun you're season just comes in, in on the 17th, right you need to back that up. If, if gun season comes in on the 17th, you may need to back that up to the 9th or 10th. You know, and your seven to ten days or whatever it is. Yeah. Generally, the closer you get to that, you know, middle of November, and sometimes it's a little later, sometimes it's a little earlier, but you're hitting the peak estrus, which is, you know, a lot of guys will think, man, peak estrus, that's when I want to be out there. Well, what that means is that's the most amount of does that are in at that time. So that buck does not have to go very far to find the next doe. He get locked down with one for two or three days. Then he just finds the next one just like that, and he t two or three days he's with her. So there's a good window there almost a week where you're probably not, he's not moving very far in the daytime. So, but, you know, and I know, Jeff, you've got a different, I think you have a different way of thinking on this, and I think I know where you're going to go with it. So I'll jump in there. Uh, well, not as a bad thing. I think I agree with you on it too, but I always have, like you said, the 14th, you killed that one. I've always had a lot of good luck at the end of that first week, beginning of the second week. So like what you're talking, ninth to the 14th would be a five-day span, I think would be really good. But it's hard to miss on the first week of November, too. Just the weather's changing, and they are starting to come in. And if you catch the right day, it can be pretty wild in that stretch, too. So, And I don't know if my numbers are just because more people are hunting mm -hmm. that, that, that teenth weekend mm -hmm. or week, or if that's what it is. I'm just telling you what the numbers are that are coming into the shop. Mm -hmm. That's that's the 10-day span that, that I see the most mature bucks. Mm -hmm. and I, I can't attribute that to why, but that's what I see. Mm -hmm. What about you, Jeff? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I want to be out there Halloween. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's while everybody's trick or treating, I'm out there looking for a treat of my own. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I it just seems like from Halloween on till, like you were saying, Scott, the the teens of November, uh, it's just hot, and you can't you can't not be out there mm -hmm. you know i'm out there every chance i can get you know the weather's changing the deer are changing everything's just changing because you know usually get, around here you usually get a good frost mm -hmm. you know around halloween and stuff and and it just kind of kicks things in motion uh you also uh a lot of people i don't know if they remember charlie all alzheimer's you know mm -hmm. All time. I don't know how you pronounce his name. That's how I pronounce it. But you know, he did a lot of studies on moon, moon phases and the rut moon and all that stuff. And and so that's a good good reference to go back to. But it always kind of referred to that season there between Halloween and the mm -hmm. middle of November, as far as how the moon falls and stuff. If you believe in the moon phases. So for me. Halloween weekend or that week of Halloween, I'm going to be out there and I'm going to hunt as hard as I can up until the point that I have other commitments here at the shop and stuff. And usually by the, after the first week of November, that's all Scott can do to hold me here because <laughs> I'm about to bust, you know, but those, those two to three weeks right in there, mm-hmm. Man, if I can get out there, I'm going, mm -hmm. and yep. I'm, I, I'll sit all day if I have to. I mean, that's just where I'm at. Yeah, that's the time of year to do it. Yep. I think it's pretty safe to say anywhere those first two weeks in November, stretch that back into October a few days. Yep. So, you know, 26th of October to, we'll say, 15th, 16th of November. If you can take your vacation in some span of those days is probably a pretty good bet. And like you said, whether you take the moon into account or not, there's some guys that's like live and die by it. Some guys mm -hmm. say it doesn't matter. Personally, I've had good hunts on full moons. I've had bad hunts on full moons. You know, I, 
I think a lot of it depends on where you're at. But like I said, some guys swear by it. Uh, there's been a lot of studies on either side of it. But. I really have had worse luck on full moons than I have on, you know, on new moons and stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just over my years of hunting uh, full moon. This just makes it tougher because the deer move more of a night than what they do daylight shooting hours. It's yeah. pretty much like daylight. It is. Night, it is. Yeah, well, they can see yeah. at night anyway. You know, they see yeah. so well at night anyway. Yeah, but I don't you know, know that it affects them. I, you know, I, I just feel like it does. They move more during the full moon because there's more light out there. I mean, maybe they can silhouette you walking to your stand and stuff. I don't know mm-hmm. because you know, there's times we've even been out coyote hunting of a night and around <laughs> that during the full moon and. You know, the coyotes can just, they can silhouette you. Mm-hmm. You got to get down low and have background and everything because that full moon, man, you stand out like a sore thumb. And I'm sure that deer is the same mm-hmm. way, you know, where they see you walking into your stands or whatever. I don't know. Right. But, you know, I think that they're more active during the nighttime, during full moon hours, than what they are during the darker moon. You know, during, so you have a, better chance during dark the moon you know for shooting light hours than what you do when there's a full moon out there i don't know that's just how i play it mm-hmm. but either way like i said whatever one you do that those first couple weeks there yes that'd be the time to do it now there are you know on some other sides of that if you just don't want to be out there in november for whatever reason or you can't once you get into the late season if you have food somewhere that you can hunt man you can really pattern a a mature buck they're going to be moving in the daylight you know to get up and eat for energy and staying warm and all that so that can be a really good time to kill a deer you know late late december later into december even mid-december sometimes and then uh, on the flip side of that in september we don't see it here in illinois because we don't start till october 1st but so most of the time the bucks are off their summer pattern by then now where you get those states where you can hunt on september 1st or 10th or 15th you're going to get bucks that are, you know, potentially still in velvet, still on their summer patterns. And again, that makes them easier to hunt because they have that pattern. Now it's going to be a lot closer to dark. You're not going to be able to hunt in the mornings necessarily without spooking deer as often. But that last 30 minutes or whatever a daylight, you got a buck on a good pattern. You got a pretty good chance of killing them. Now also in that time around here, it still could be 95 degrees and you're fighting the bugs and everything else. So that's not my cup of tea. All those things combined, I'm in the same boat you guys are. Last few days of October into the, you know, early second week, or uh, well, I guess into the second week of November, I think those would be the best days. So, and I did see one of those questions on the Southern Illinois Deer Hunter page too. So, I thought it was a good one to tie in there and and kind of end on that. So, unless you guys got anything else, I think that's where we're going to wrap it up for the night. It was good to get back. I've been ready to get back and do another one. So, hopefully, we can get back on a regular schedule now and get some more podcasts out there as we roll into the season because we're getting closer i mean we've got like i said a month and a half Mm -hmm. two months yeah we still some people two months fall food plus put in Mm -hmm. and we're getting ready to hit that season we got a lot of work to do here in the next couple weeks so and you're gonna bake while you're doing (laughs) yeah yeah but the rewards are worth it that's right this is the sweating part of the year here in the next couple weeks you start preparing plots and then planting in the middle of august to september but like you said the reward's worth it yeah when you're sitting behind that buck on november 8th (laughs) yeah or halloween yeah or halloween Halloween, 14th yeah we got you know uh that property where i'm hunting at and where we set our stand up at and stuff you know Oh, that's our stand? Well, my stand. Oh, okay. You're just going to be sitting in the pine tree behind oh, me. I was just checking. Going. Right. <laughs> Anyways, you know. Make sure I didn't misunderstand you. Right. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to put a new food plot in there. And, you know, it's time to get in there and start bush hogging and spraying and getting it ready, you know. And yep. Yeah, because we got. And then even on. Um, almost a week till the end of July. Less, a little over a week till the end of July. Ten days. So. Yep. And even there on my property, you know, that you do the vlog on, you know, uh, we're going to have to start thinking about spraying that and putting I sprayed our... that today, actually. Oh, did you? Yep. Well, see, I was at work, so I didn't yeah. So, anyways, we can go in there and work that up and start putting our oats and rye down and stuff for mm-hmm. the fall plot, so. 
Yeah. Now's the time to start thinking about if you got mowing to do and all that, start thinking about doing that because you're going to want to mow it and give it a chance to start coming back before you spray it. And then you spray it. You got another 10, 14 days till you can do anything with it. And then you're hitting about right smack into plant season somewhere in middle of August to middle of September, depending on what the weather's like. But right. We're supposed to get some rain next week too. So that'll help soften the ground up a little bit, yeah. maybe. But anyway, that's where we're going to wrap it up tonight. Thanks for listening, guys. Sorry it's been a while since we've got one out. We'll try to be more consistent now that we get things rolling. Uh, we'll get back into the busy season here for the next month or so, but we'll try to get them out. Thanks for listening, guys, and we will catch you again next week.